We've all seen these people, destitute, delusional, muttering to themselves. For the most part, we just walk away and keep going. But every time I pass one of these people, I think, that could be my mother. My sister Tina and I call mom regularly to keep tabs, but there always comes the day when she doesn't pick up the phone. We call the various agencies and social workers, trying to find her. Once again, it's come to a crisis, and I'm back in Chicago to see our mother, Millie. She's on a psych ward, and I'm worried sick. She's served by the public health system, and because of laws concerning a patient's confidentiality rights, no one tells us anything. We have no right to information about our own mother. After years and years of this, I'm angry and fed up. My frustration with the system and confusion about mom's illness has fueled my need to tell this story. Elgin Mental Health Center, once known as the Northern Illinois Hospital for the Insane. It's famous in these parts as the end of the line for the severely mentally ill. My mother hates it. It makes her feel like she's in jail, and she can't figure out what she did to get here. There's something wrong with me. I've been working it over and over at Elgin. Now, I'm here, I'm in Elgin because I had, you know, I lost all my money. And then I didn't even replace it. I know that's why I'm there. Because I'm down to my last penny and there is something wrong with a person, whether they're a woman or not, to just go lose all her money and spend all her mother's money. Whether I fit into that category that mentally ill people fit into or not, I, I'm bankrupt and there's something wrong with me. One of the most confounding aspects of mom's illness is that she has no insight about it, no awareness that she has it. So telling mom she's sick sounds as crazy to her as telling her I'm not her daughter. She doesn't understand why over the last 20 years, she's been in and out of 17 psych wards, eight apartments, three boarding houses, and countless motels. She hasn't been able to hold a job in 30 years. She's alienated her family and lost touch with every friend she's ever had. When she's released, we'll have to find her yet another place to live. After two months at Elgin, she stabilized on her meds, and it seems like she can take care of herself. But I know she can't. Do you agree with this diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia? I know what paranoia is, yes, but schizophrenia, no. I never understood that in seven years of medical school. I could never get a grasp on that. Is Val Kilmer supposed to be a nice guy? I don't know. He's always so funny. <laughs> I can't stand that. And Chris Farley, he had me writhing in pain one time. I thought it got to the point where my laughing was dangerous and I had to give up comedy too. Why? I was injuring things in my throat and unable to breathe and I was Maybe it's the same as crying. It's one of those uh, little deviated emotional things. I, to laugh that hard. Nobody <laughs> could be that funny, but they were. You know what's really good to see? What? Is how, what a good place you're in. 
You seem happier than I've seen you in a long time. It's because you're here. And I'm honored that you're... How can you even care about anything? I, I'm sorry, I have low self-esteem. What anybody can see in that woman. When Jeff and I went on our first date and I knew that he uh, really cared for me, I said, okay, you want to go on another date, you have to meet my mother. Because my mother is a part of me and a part of my life and she... I'm a product of my upbringing. She had these steely eyes, and they weren't looking at me. They were definitely looking through me. She acknowledged that I was there, but she was distant. That was quite unusual. I'd never quite experienced anything like that. You know, I slipped my throat and wrist. Blood everywhere. What were you thinking? I wasn't. The noise in? pollution was awful. It was like 10 billion years of hell slamming through my head. The noise pollution temporarily set something off in my head. Uh, the circuitry, you know, you have circuits in your head yeah. that make the uh, dense yeah. parts of your brain work for you. Mm -hmm. And it all, I think the circuitry missed a connection or something. The police are mad at me to this day. They were the Illinois police <laughs> say they don't want anything to do with that bloodbath woman. <laughs> I got mad at them for calling me a bloodbath woman. I told them they should do something about their creep spell problems. <laughs> Try to clean up Illinois and make it a more livable state. Her mind intrigues me. I find being curious helps keep at bay all that I feel. Before mom was taken to Elgin, she was living in my grandmother's empty house. She was withdrawn and isolated and hadn't taken her medication in weeks. I came to town to check in on her and for the first time I brought my camera. And us, we call you. Yeah. But you talk to strangers, Susan, and I don't want you dragging me into it. It's positively frightening to me the way you flit around talking to anybody and everybody, and that you even drag me into it. You have a nerve on you, and it better not ever happen again. Don't you drag me in with any goddamn people. I don't mean to drag you into it. Well, you better not ever again, so help me. I'll haul you into court. Can you explain? I'll haul you into court if you ever drag me in with any of these fucking slops again. Did I just now drag you into it by talking? I've had it, yes. Don't even mention their goddamn name. I don't like to throw up. I'm sick and tired of it. As usual, she was furious with me for meddling in her affairs. When mom's illness takes over, I become the enemy. to my father's house to talk with him about mom. They divorced when I was four and Tina was two. Back then, mothers were always given custody of the children. When did you first know something was wrong, Dad? When she gave birth to our little Susan, who was a darling as could be, when we brought her home in my beat-up old little Chevrolet car and she became terribly despondent and, and irrational. And then I'd say about three, three weeks into coming home, 
she tried to commit suicide. She cut her wrists. I said, my God, what am I dealing with here? This is, this is an unusual circumstance. Did she... She's not rational. I think she's nuts. <laughs> and I said, what did I do? She had great waves of despair, like she's in a deep tunnel. And other times, um, she's uh, emotionally hysterical. The great highs were high, the great lows were terribly low, but more low than high. There was one time that I asked her when it is that she began to feel that things weren't right for her. And what did she say? And she said to me, without any hesitation at all, I've never been right. Nothing has ever been right for me. And I said, even when you were a little girl, Millie, because we had so much fun and, and everything was just so normal when we were growing up, and she said, I was pretending then. I took Mom out of Elgin on a day pass. We did all the things we usually do when I spring her from the psych ward. Shop, eat lunch, try to pretend we're just your typical mother and daughter. Um, Mom, do you want to try anything? Let's get, do you want to get short? Yeah. Small. They don't have any mediums in that color. Which ones do you like better? I like this this color better. better it's just color. the color. That's it. I don't want to spend it on you know your money. It's all right. There's more where it came from. Okay. Yeah. I'll just buy, take you on the next shopping spree. Right. No, I'm going to get the square neck in that color because I like the, this different neckline for a change. Yeah. Aren't I a drag? <laughs> I'll get these shorts and then that'll be it. Just we'll try them on, right? Right. I have an unhappy face, don't I? You have sad oh. eyes. Yeah. Sad eyes. I'll have to make them up again. <laughs> get the right medication and put makeup on them. You know what I think would be good is to, is to go into one of those transitional places for a few months and then get a place of Like own. CAP? Yeah. Okay. Just for a few months. Okay. I'll go to CAP for a few months. And then... She said I was a priority. That's what I heard, that you were actually second on the list. Oh, good. Which they said could be anywhere from three weeks to three months. Oh, excellent. Oh, I won't worry so much then. Yeah, that's what... Uh, you know, when every day is a month long in a place like that, you feel like you've been there forever and like you'll be there forever. Yeah, in the Midnight Express, when I'm free, I'm going to click my heels like he did at the end of the movie. Jump in the air and click his heels. Finally got free from a Turkish insane asylum. At the end of the movie, is that what That's what I'm going to do. Jump in the air, click my heels, I'm free. Finally. What's going to make you feel free? When I get a home, and I really don't want to live at the YMCA. Just saying it would be satisfactory, better than what else I had to go through. I get into this pit of despair. I didn't want to be around her to try to understand my adjustments, let alone a woman who has qualities that I did not even comprehend until I'm already involved with a person is mind-boggling. How can any human being, a father, leave children that are one and a half and three years old? How can you possibly see a child, an infant, just crawling, a toddler, and a little girl, as cute as two little girls, as cute as can be. How can I believe like that? I had to survive. Soon after his divorce, my father married my stepmom, Nancy, and they had three kids of their own. Their life seemed happy and relaxed, and to Tina and me, it felt like an eternity between visits to their house. 
especially because life with mom was growing really frightening. She was becoming more and more paranoid and erratic. Even in college, when she was in college before she got married, I didn't notice any, you know, delusional behavior. It was actually it was much later after she had the two, you know, you and your sister, that I noticed anything where she would, you know, ramble on and talk and not make any sense. One time I had to bite my tongue to keep from laughing because she said that she'd been watching Johnny Carson the night before on television and that... Uh, he had told her on the show that she should run for president of the United States. <laughs> I said, really? I talked with my sister through the years of making this film. We shared a common experience, so I hoped she could help me sort through the mysteries of mom's illness. I think Mildred could keep it together when people visited so that other outsiders didn't have the sense that she even had anything wrong with her. Uh, we always thought as children that people, we had cameras all over the house, little cameras, and people, the FBI or the CIA were spying on us. Our teachers were spies. They were out to get us. As a kid, I didn't think mom was lying, but I was also pretty sure our teachers weren't secretly spying on us or that TV people spoke to mom directly. One might think these delusions would have caused somebody to ask questions, like what exactly was going on. Tina and I just figured this was the way mothers were. The next time we took mom out of Elgin, Tina brought her whole family. The kids hadn't seen their grandmother in over a year because she was in such a bad way. Hi. How are you feeling? Fine, thank you. Does it taste good? No. Yeah, but she's good piping hot. In your wildest dreams, what makes you the happiest? Children. Yeah. Do you have any regrets? I'm sure I do, but I had to put them aside. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's why. I told Tina about the screaming. I said, you bitches scared me to death. Don't make the same mistakes I did and scream like that at your kids. Mm -hmm. And never hit the kid. She beat you horribly. It was always you being, getting the brunt of the beatings. And that was my first memory of her being terribly horrid to us. I did not want Tina to bring this up. That was not part of the movie I wanted to make. But as I thought about it, I decided it wasn't right to hide it either. Jackie Kennedy said, if one fails with one's children, nothing else matters. Mm -hmm. There wasn't anybody around us. I didn't think the neighbors cared. We'd go outside, she'd beat us outside, and that one neighbor would come out and help us even though they were only a few feet away, not one neighbor. And it bothers me to this day, because one of the neighbors, he was the police chief. Another neighbor, we babysat for their children. The woman across the street was always outside in her garden. And why did people ignore the fact that we were being beaten? We left our windows open sometimes in the summer so we could Maybe have the hope that somebody would hear us. On bad days, my mother was violent. On good days, she would sleep all day, though that meant she'd forget to feed us or change my sister's diapers. So I did it instead. Why didn't I tell Dad what she was like? 
terror, plain and simple. I was afraid he wouldn't believe me. I was afraid of betraying her and that she might literally kill me for telling him. So I waited for the day when Dad would see into my soul and come rescue us. She didn't always dress in the morning or she, she wouldn't always be up. And the, the house just got worse and worse and things were unattended to. Uh, you and your sister were, I don't know how you managed to go, get to school, uh, frankly, and uh, I think she just really started slipping more into a really a depressed state then. I mean, if, if somebody from the Department of Children and Family Services had ever walked into that house, at certain times they would have yanked you right out. We knew our mother was a horrible human being sometimes, but she could be so loving, and it was just so confusing. It was those loving moments, brief glimpses into the sweet soul hidden deep within my mother that kept us devoted to her, always hoping for more. And I think it kept other people believing everything was okay. It truly did not occur to me that the two of you were victims as well. I, I just can't because you weren't in front of me all the time because when I would leave her I would leave her with uh, relief that I was not under her gaze which was very penetrating at the least uh, that I just it was out of sight out of mind I don't know the three of us were isolated mom by her illness Tina and I by our fear and humiliation. When I was 12, I finally mustered the courage to leave Mom and move in with Dad. But even then, I wasn't able to communicate to him how horrible things had been. Since Tina's survival tactic had always been to ingratiate herself with Mom, I was sure when I left she'd be all right. I was wrong. To live every day not knowing if I was going to wake up in the morning and be alive by the end of the day, constantly throughout my entire childhood. I just, it's not what, I thought, well, this must be, I'm going to do what my mom wants me to do. I'm going to get out of her life. I'm going to make my mom happy. So I thought by killing myself, my mother would be happy. And I was devastated when you moved out. You were my security. You're what kept me alive. After Tina's suicide attempt, my father filed for custody of her. She was placed under the care of a psychiatrist who finally gave us a name for mom's behavior. Until then, I didn't even know she had an illness. I ran to the library to look up schizophrenia, and it was there I learned that as my mother's child, I had a 10% chance of becoming mentally ill myself, most likely by the age of 25. From that moment, I started to analyze my mind and scrutinize my behavior. By my mid-20s, I knew I had escaped mom's fate, and frankly, I wanted to escape her. And for many years I did. But it was hard knowing that mom was becoming more and more disabled. She became increasingly withdrawn and despondent. She sold her house and lost all her money. She attempted suicide and was then sucked into the public health system. Only recently, Tina and I learned we could take on the system and have more knowledge and control over her care. We went to court. We sued the state for guardianship of our mother. How do you feel about what we're doing, seeking guardianship? It's the only alternative for Millie. We've tried everything else. She's exhausted her every housing situation she's ever been in. She's 
been in and out of the hospital so much, it's exhausting. We find out she's been evicted the day after she's been evicted, and she's already been brought to the psych ward of the hospital, and we don't know where she is. They won't tell us if she's in the hospital because it, she hasn't signed the release of information. As far as we know, she's out on the, out on the street. But having the guardianship, how do you think that's going to change things for you? I won't be so fearful being unattached to anybody. I won't feel like it was a mistake that I was born and that I'm an orphan anymore. Very precarious feeling. Scary. Scary. No stability. No roots. And you wouldn't know where to turn. Mm -mm. I'm faced with a moral battle, a true crisis of my conscience. Can I be the parent to Millie that she has never been to me? I think the most important thing to understand God is to understand forgiveness. and. Um, once I understood her disease um, as a young teenager and as a young adult, then I was able to forgive her for her uh, atrocities against you and I. What I had a difficult time with was forgiving my father, who was the sane person, from walking away and not ever coming back to help us. I try to conduct myself in a manner th that I thought I had a rational ex-wife who cherished her children, which obviously she had not. And my children were placed basically in a prison uh, that I may subconsciously been aware of, but I didn't have either the mental, physical, or financial strength to fight it. Everyone had their reasons for not getting involved with Millie. But how could they have been in such denial? Because like most people, they didn't know anything about mental illness. Shame and ignorance causes families, friends, and neighbors to turn a blind eye to destructive behavior, hoping it will magically go away with time. I swing between a profound sense of betrayal at my family's inability to help us and empathy for their need to look away. When she was released from Elgin, Mom was moved to the supervised apartment, which seemed like the best place in the system for her. Staff would administer meds, help her get a job, and teach her life skills so she might live on her own again. As her new guardians, we hoped we could finally help Mom pull her life together. Well, especially when you didn't have a phone, we didn't know how you were doing. We couldn't get in touch with you. We didn't know. We don't want to get in that situation again. So it won't happen again. I, I still want to leave a note here. Mildred's caseworker doesn't speak to us weekly regarding Mildred, and we need to be informed on how Mildred is doing. Well, I yeah. see more of her than I'd like to, all of them. And the lady I'm living with, you know, I go in my own room and close the door. So it, they're all strangers. I'm getting kind of old to be so flexible. I just wrote a note. We are not informed weekly of Mildred's well-being and dated it today. Why are you responsible for picking up the drugs yourself? We just are. And for taking them ourselves, too, pretty soon. Oh, yeah? Or eventually. Dwayne was asking, you know, why can't you take them yourself? So they don't want to be responsible for administering them anymore? Nope, this way. Well, Dwayne didn't. Who is Dwayne? Well, He's an overnight. Oh, okay. I was concerned about mom having the responsibility of dealing with her meds on her own. I mean, from her perspective, she doesn't believe she's ill, so why should she need to take medication? Hi. Yes. My prescription is that I called in. Mildred Smiley. Okay.
risperidone. It's not doodle, 1218. Fenstro green. Uh, clonazepam is not doodle, 12, uh, yeah, 1212. 12. So while you're here, let me try Zoloft. Which is this one you got, Nelly? They use the generic name. I call it, uh, I forgot what I call it. I don't like to talk about it. Okay. I have to live this way. It just makes it twice as uh, unpleasant to talk about it besides. I understand. Yeah, okay. I think it's my age. I'm very sensitive about being in this immature position. And we've talked about that. Yeah. Too. You know, it's hard. It's very, very yeah. difficult. But you actually might be getting another roommate who's a little older. So that might help. She's very nice. No, woman. I'd rather live with a man. Oh, dear. Peggy wants You're to not get allowed to live with a man here, Mildred. Peggy wants to get married someday. Right. Well, I do too. Well, and that's fine. That's yeah. totally fine. You're just not allowed to live with a man here. Right. So Richard Chamberlain's gay, huh? I really like him. Try someone else. <laughs> well, I can't think at the moment. Al Pacino did something to his teeth, and he's been acting just off. <laughs> we used to have that little Volkswagen, and we'd sit in the back seat, the very back of it. And um, I'd ask her to go ahead and if she could race that guy next to you. So she would race along the highway as fast as she could. And I'd be saying, beat him, beat him. Not realizing that it was dangerous, it was fun. Racing these young college boys or young high school boys with us in the back seat. She got herself in some really funny situations because she just lacked very clear judgment when she drove. I mean, now that I look back, it's not. I would never do that with my children, but as a child, that was fun. I wish my blonde hair had stayed blonde. You look good with blonde I'd hair. I'd be jealous of myself, my real blonde hair. Blonde hair and brown eyes. Right. I don't remember ever looking at myself in the mirror to this day, I can't remember thinking that I was cute, but everybody around me was always taking pictures. Oh, you were beautiful. That little gorgeous. girl? That little blonde oh, girl? You were gorgeous. Grace Kelly. Everyone used to liken you to Grace Kelly. Really? Well, I liked her, too. just a normal kid, actually a doting older sister. It was when she got to be a teenager that, uh, you know, her problems started to emerge. She had something inside that she was mad at somebody all the time. Mostly, actually it was mostly just her parents. I think her disease has been influenced and it became worse because of her upbringing. She had no father in the picture. He died as a war veteran in World War II. Catherine was a nurse, but she was um, from the elite society, so having a child that misbehaved was just not acceptable. And I think she was very embarrassed by Mildred's behavior and very ashamed of Mildred's behavior, and I think she mistreated Mildred because of it. She didn't understand, and they didn't. people didn't understand them. Pick up your feet. Be careful of yourself with this bruise, mother. I tried to talk to your grandmother about it on numerous occasions. Now that I really did try to do. But every single time I brought up the subject that there was something wrong with Millie, she pooh-poohed the whole thing and said that Millie was just high-strung, that her being in nurse's training at the time had 
destroyed her health and that her life was very difficult because of being a single mom and the divorce from Alan. It's not your fault that your skin broke out. It's not your fault. It's drugs and germs and it's happening to everybody, even Elizabeth Taylor. Sure to pick up your feet. Bye, Grams. Bye. Bye. I love you. We'll see you tomorrow, okay? Okay. I'm terribly distraught about this. Fun. You hold it together really well. I keep everything in. I don't cry anymore. I don't want to. I lost enough of my eyebrows and eyelashes. <laughs> if that ever happened to me. Sit there, carcass and clothes, like those old ladies at the YMCA. If her parents were alive, this never would have happened. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm locked up in a nursing home, too, and on my deathbed, too. It's just, I can't separate the people. I feel so bad. I feel so sorry for her. I could just lay down and die. That disgusting hot shot chink out at that nursing home going on about my mother. And that's always something. Some putrid, disgusting, he's way out of line, hot shot. Like antidepressants are going to help that poor woman now, it's disgusting. Some ignorant, he doesn't even know a fucking thing about it. Disgusting, obnoxious, filthy, pervert chink. I've had it with this whole goddamn thing, and you, you stand there and listen to that fucking bullshit. That goddamn place is disgusting. This whole goddamn state is disgusting. This whole goddamn country is disgusting. I took care of people all my life. All my life I took care of people, animals, things, everything. I am not going to wind up treated like some kind of faggot like she is. I'm not going to end up like that. Don't you ever drag me into anybody again. I'll get my own friends or I won't have anybody. I'll go it alone. People are the most disgusting things on the face of the earth. They're disgusting. Our grandmother died soon after that visit, and Mom wasn't handling it very well. It wasn't surprising that two months later, she was back on the psych ward and refusing all treatment. Whatever happened to my dream apartment, Susan? What's the matter with you and your family? You know, I said you could get your dream apartment if you got... You said you are not my guardian, your hideous, uh, nasty meanies. Everybody has to work toward their goals. I've been working all my life, Susan. I'm some, not kind of, some kind of work or another. I'm not going back to see that total stranger black bitch. And I can't relate to you Jews. I don't know what to say, Mom. Um, the way it is right now, they, you probably won't be able to stay at the camp apartment anymore. It's not an apartment. It's not even a prison. Yeah, but the fact that, the fact that you hate it so much and it's... Susan, so you have no idea how horrible it is up there. 
Yeah, but m mom, let me tell you your alternative. Your alternative is a nursing home. That's I don't need nursing. I'm perfectly healthy. I walk everywhere. I don't drink or smoke or take drugs. I eat properly. I've had it with the United States and my being a fruit lady and you being enema bags. After a two-week standoff, the doctor says mom's his most defiant patient. We had to get her to sign a consent form to receive an injection of prolixin, an antipsychotic. This was our only hope for getting her back on track. Well, I told you about that apartment that was possibly available in Minnesota. I have um, a paper here. If you could sign it regarding that, that would be great. I can't. This light is terrible. I many. That way you can go into the apartment with me. That would be awesome. Right. Because that's what Charles and they want. They want their grandma. I can't stand on there. too many problems. Oh, I know. I know. How old are you, Millie? Oh, you're a baby. You're a baby. I can't imagine lying like that, though, Tina. It's so deeply deceitful. I just, I am not capable of lying that badly to her. I mean, she signed a paper that was completely false to her. I mean, they you had her sign only. something that you thought was her ticket to freedom, and... Well, it is her ticket to freedom. She doesn't realize that in order for her to have the life she wants, she has to be medicated to get her brain straight. And if I have to lie to her to get that, but then Tina, I'll... she thinks she's moving to Minnesota in three weeks. I'll tell her that uh, there's a delay. Boys are in camp. Jeff is real busy. One of the doctors quit. Uh, the house flooded. Uh, so you're Charles has strep throat. Um, it doesn't. I love you, Mom. Who's going to come down and get me? Um, if it's not me, then it'll be Jeff. Okay. And either Charles or Eddie. It depends. They only have 10 days of school left. So you're going to have to probably wait at least 10 days. But until Tina, out of school. It won't, it'll be a while, won't it? I can't wait to get out of here. There's better things to do. Yeah. So in 10 days, the boys get out of school, and then I have them enrolled in camp, basketball camp, that uh -huh. Trent Tucker basketball uh -huh. camp. That's a week, and then we're going to a dude ranch. Have Charles give me a call. He's such a sweetheart. Yes, he, he is. is. His grandpa. Yes, I miss all of you. She signed her freedom, is what she did. That's what the intention of this whole visit was about. I figure lying to her is a sweet thing to do, other than letting her go homeless and die a horrid death like that. I'd rather her die in a situation where at least she has a roof over her head, she has people that love her around her, even though she doesn't figure it out. Do you understand where I'm coming from? So if I have to lie, I'm going to fucking lie. Deceiving her to sign that piece of paper, a ticket to freedom, because it's going to c continue the cycle of the medication, the housing, the end of medication, the losing the housing, and it's going to go on and on and on. Yeah. And I guess that's the point I'm trying to yeah, make. Yeah, that's true. But that's where my conscience would bother me. Right. You know, each of us do what we can live with in our own conscience, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we do what we feel is best. I know you're doing what you feel is best, and I know I'm doing what I feel is best. You yes. know, you know yes. where that comes from, Susan? Yes. Because you're older, and you had that moment in your life where you knew what normalcy was because you had somebody normal in your life. I never had anybody normal in my life. That gave you more of a conscience about what right and wrong was nor did, did I understand the full ramifications of my childhood until I became a parent myself. Everyone has their own path in life, and she's going to find her, her road, which road she needs to follow. And it might not happen until she takes her very last breath of her life. It'll happen, though. It'll happen. I think you have an excellent point. You made an excellent point by your way of dealing with her, and we were fucked up for 
for for years. And it hasn't been until now that I am thinking so clearly for the first time in my entire life because this woman will never be free until she's gone. Never. Mom was given the injection, but I hated that it was our betrayal that got her on the road to recovery. She believes so strongly in her version of reality that it forces me to ask myself whether I have the right to intervene in her life. The county dumped her in this nursing home because it's the only place in the system that has a bed for her. Problem is, she's been assigned an absentee psychiatrist who's clueless about her history, the latest in a long line of nameless, faceless doctors to offer a panacea for her condition. Small room, huh? Yeah. Do you get a little bit of privacy with this? I don't draw that. Debbie doesn't bother me. Is it quiet? No. no. Never quiet. It's utter chaos here. It seems clean. It could be worse. We're clean. She's clean and I'm clean. I've had pigsty roommates. Yeah. That's why I'm worried about who I might get after she leaves. So I hope it's not much longer that I have to wait for the group home. Everywhere mom lands within the fractured system, she gets a new doctor who has a different idea of how to treat her. This time, I was really shocked at the number of meds she was assigned. This is Zoloft. This is an antidepressant. This is... Melorel. It's a major tranquilizer for psychosis. I don't know what this is. It's for restlessness and uh, side effects. This is Depakote. That's for mood swings. This is... Desiril, it's for sleeping, and this is Ativan, it's for anxiousness. And they all have side effects and they all interact not very well. Right. So one leads to another and it's a big snowball effect, isn't it? It's a big, yeah, it is. I'm too much of a purist to be mixed up in all of this. Mm hmm do you think these things are helpful? No, you're better off going to health food stores and an ounce of prevention's worth a pound to cure you better off not getting sick. Staying healthy all your life. Living healthfully and a full life and avoiding these pitfalls. I just can't understand how the state got a hold of me. Being a ward of the state, it's just a horror. I just can't understand it. Do you see any way out? It's kidnapping. It is. It is. And the police harassed me all my life. They ate me out of house and home when I had a car, and then when I didn't have a car, they picked on me on foot. I've been whisked away to Madden and all kinds of places, whisked away to a place in Chicago, whisked away. I'm always getting kidnapped. Paramedics and police are always kidnapping me. I consider it kidnapping the whole thing. Now I'm whisked away to a nursing home. I'm homesick. She's been in the nursing home for a year when a space finally opens up in a group home, the holy grail of placements. The only hitch is she has to pass a battery of interviews assessing her mental health in order to get the space. This is my 
check that was photocopied. This is my public aid insurance card. This is about being resuscitated that I don't want that because I'd have brain damage. And this, these are my um, drugs. And this is my social security card. What kind of jacket do I need? I like jacket. It's chilly. Gosh, I'm old. I'll be 60 June 7th. June 2nd. 6-0. That's why we have to take you to Jamaica. Yeah. For your 60th. Okay. At this point, we knew that the group home placement would be critical to mom's chance at some kind of rehabilitation. She knows how much is at stake, but I seriously questioned if she could pull it off. Okay. When you're in services at the group home and you see the doctor, you can make those arrangements with the doctor. Let them know how you're feeling me, okay. and they'll help you with the medication. Okay. Okay. Have you ever thought people were out to get you, trying to hurt you? No, but I have been ganged up on. Mm -hmm. And I have been mistreated and screamed at. I've had a lot of people scream at me. Dr. Kama? Yeah. Hi. Hi. I'm Susan Smiley. Glad to meet you. Hi. I'm Mildred Smiley's daughter and uh -huh. her guardian. I've been working on a documentary following Millie's treatment and care over the last couple of years, so would you mind if I film this? Okay. Why don't you just want to put the camera outside somewhere? So seriously? You oh, seriously. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Before you came in, she was very, very paranoid. Was she? Yeah. Yeah. If you asked her, Sue, whether she was able to, to tolerate it, would she give you an honest answer? Whether she was able to tolerate this move and how she was feeling, and was she able to make this move now, would she answer you honestly? As honestly as she possibly can. Um, I can give you my honest, objective sort of observation about it. And um, that is, yes, I do think she was able to tolerate the move. All you have to do is get through this transition. And then I'll be they don't treat any other mentally ill people successfully either. They just get worse all the time. They don't know what they're doing with the drugs or anything. They don't know if it's chemical. There's no way of testing someone's brain, put a needle in and take out chemicals. They don't even know what they're doing. Psychiatric problems in the United States just keep on getting worse and worse and worse. And hanging around with sick people, uh, can I can just get sick myself from them. Another big concern that my sister and I have, and this has been throughout all her moves and hospitalizations, whatever, is as soon as she gets a new doctor, she gets taken off one thing, put on something else, and there's... Uh, tremendous lack of consistency of things which causes a lot of problems and so I just want you know it's a concern of ours to make sure there's some consistency there and um, well you know our, our records are a little bit um, we don't have a lot of good records from her past treatment I didn't try to hurt myself it was completely an accident yeah. I am accident prone sometimes I think it's going very well. Are you still nervous? Yes, I'm so anxious to turn my life around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot at stake, isn't there? It's all going to be fine. It is. It's it's really good. It's all good. When we were told Mom passed her health assessment, I was hugely relieved. For the first time in years, I felt a sense of promise for the possibilities ahead. Now she's going to move into the group home. It's her 47th home in 20 years. She kept telling me, she's like, Wendy, you know, I really want to move out. I want to get my own job. I want to get my own place. 
and I want to move up. And her dream came true. Good luck. We're working in this, aren't we? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good luck to you. What time are you going? You take care of yourself. Okay. Okay. Unlike anywhere else mom has lived, this will be a stable and secure home, a permanent residence. No matter what happens, she can't be evicted. She'll finally have a chance to feel safe. Really loves kitties. I came back six months later, and things seemed really different. Hello? Hello? Yeah. Hi. Hey. Hi. Nice to see you. Hi. Hey, you too. This is the best situation you've been in a long time. It is. I have a job. This is beautiful. Mm. You put your... We think alike. Open yours. <laughs> I love work. It's normal people. The bus is normal people. You're normal people. Your family and friends are normal people. I can hardly stand it. Mom's holding down her first job in nearly 30 years. She's a dishwasher at a sandwich shop. Tell me about how you feel about having this job. It's something to look forward to when I get up in the morning. And I want to have a savings account and be able to pay for my funeral. <laughs> and leave you something when I go. I'm just too materialistic to be totally broke. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I'm very enthusiastic about the food. It's delicious food. It's nourishing. It's seductive. It's, right. it's gourmet fast food. I'm anxious to get there in the morning, and I'm anxious to go home at night. Well, that's normal, isn't it? Yeah, and I look forward to weekends, and then I look forward to Monday, too. <laughs> well, that's healthy. Yeah, I hope so. When she first came in, uh, she was a lot sicker than she is now. Um, I think the medication has really... Uh, been working a lot better for her. A lot of the goals that she had that she wasn't doing so good on when she first started, she's getting like 100% now. Really? Now we have to find new goals for her. <laughs> really? Right. Finally, she's on the correct medication, and taking it twice a day is a group home requirement. Emily, what do we got there? This is an antipsychotic. There's 40 milligrams of that. This is 500 milligrams of calcium for bones and teeth. And this Notice how they help you have happier thoughts? Why are you pressing? No. And when you're not taking them, you, you have less happy thoughts? No. You haven't noticed that difference? No. I hate this state, Susan. Don't press me about drugs and happiness. She still cannot make the connection between the b benefits that the meds give her versus not. Right. She's not making that connection. She's uh, not seeing the cause and effect. She'll probably always believe she's a victim of the system and not the victim of an illness. The sad truth is, it's both. Circumstances beyond her control have led her here and this may be the most she can achieve. But it's heartbreaking to know that she may never be able to live on her own, fall in love, or live without nightmares. You want mine? Yeah, I'll have grab the cake. Oh. 
she's been incredibly um, nice. She's um, not paranoid, friendly, articulate. She's becoming more um, respectful of herself and of others. Yeah, I saw that you were filming, and so I quit waving. What a beautiful coat. Thank you. Mom's spending Christmas Day with the rest of my family at Dad's house. She's been an outsider for so long. It's such a sweet victory that she can be a part of the family. It's the first time she and Dad have seen each other in years. Hi, Nancy. 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 Hi,